when passion does enter, it often enters in the form of shouting matches where people are shouting mm. past one another on mm. cable television or something like that. And what's missing is uh, reasoned but passionate debate about big ethical questions, including questions about justice, equality and inequality, the common good, what does it mean to be a citizen? Now, these are contestable questions. They're unavoidably contestable questions. Mm -hmm. But it's almost as if the ideal of a value-neutral market mechanism has been embraced as an alternative to the messy, contested character of democratic public discourse. And you're, you're asking us not to take things for granted. You're asking us to bring that architecture to life and re-examine it. Am I, am I right? Is that, is that where you're at? Yes, that, that is the project. It's in a way to reconnect economics uh, with its home in moral and, and political philosophy. Um, going back to the classical economists from Adam Smith to Karl Marx, despite their ideological differences, they agreed with the notion that economics was not a, a value-neutral science, an autonomous discipline. Mm -hmm. They knew that it was a branch, a subfield of moral and political philosophy. Back then they called it moral and political economy. Mm -hmm. To be an economist was also at the same time to be a, a philosopher. And we've lost touch with that uh, connection between um, economics and normative questions. Yes. And, and I, think it's, um, I think it's distorted the way we teach economics, and I also think it's, it's distorted the way we practice um, economics and in, in policy. And so part of the, the goal of, of my project is, is to reconnect um, market reasoning with moral reasoning, economics with moral and political philosophy. Why did it get disconnected? And is economics unique in that respect, or do you see that disconnection taking place uh, across a broad spectrum of, in, of social inquiry? I think, uh, to a large extent, it's true in the social sciences generally. Uh, the, the bid to make the social sciences more like the, the natural sciences and, but economics has done this much more plausibly, much more successfully mm -hmm. than any other social science. Successful in the sense that they've convinced other people they have authority, or successful in the sense that you see them producing scientific evidence you find convincing? The first. Okay. The first. Okay. And so, so you might call them con men of extraordinary capability as distinct from scientists. Well, let me put it this way. I, I would say that um, in, the, in the 20th century, economics established itself as a separate department of inquiry. Uh, it presented itself as a value-neutral science of human behavior and social choice. And within the academy, but also within public policy, this vision of economics gained great currency uh, and persuasive power and prestige. Yes. And so that's what I mean when I say successfully. Now, I think that it's um, a spurious um, uh, science to, if it's understood as detached from broader questions of moral and political philosophy. And part of what I try to do in, in the book and also in this project is to show the intimate connections between what we all recognize are economic questions mm -hmm. and judgments about values and ethics and justice and how to value goods. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to, to bring out this, the unavoidability of the normative questions that are implicit in economics, but that mainstream economics often doesn't recognize. What I find most attractive about what you're doing you're not telling us it's a different answer. You're asking us to go in search of answers as though it's valid to look at the question again. Mm -hmm. yes. and, and that is, I think, a much more attractive magnet 
than being told something different is true. We got to do the work ourselves. We Doesn't do. that enliven our politics if we start to do that work together again? Yes, and the we who need to do that work are not we qua academics, but we as democratic citizens. I think yes. it's striking that during the last three to four decades, when the faith uh, in market thinking, uh, the faith in market mechanisms as the primary instruments mm -hmm. for defining the public good, when that faith has, we, we've been in the grip of that faith in public life in many Western democracies over the past three to four decades. I think it's no accident during that same period there has been a kind of hollowing out, an emptiness in the terms of democratic discourse. And when we look around the world today and uh, we see the frustration of citizens in democracies almost everywhere with politicians, with politics, with political parties. And I think the reason is they're frustrated with the empty terms of public discourse. How do we get to the place where the common good, mm -hmm. which I think surrounds humanity, mm -hmm. nature, maybe even people would include animals, but certainly all human beings. Mm -hmm. How do we get to the place where that otherness doesn't mean the common good is dis decided as though women don't exist, as though black people right. don't exist or right. Hispanics don't exist. Right. How do you educate people into removing that divide? Yeah. For me, um, I come at, at all of these questions uh, having studied uh, political philosophy. And philosophy um, at its core is about questioning, about asking questions. All the way back to, uh, and philosophy seems very abstract, but I think that philosophy at its, at its best has to connect with the life of the city, the way we live our lives, the assumptions by mm -hmm. which we live. If you go back to the beginnings of philosophy in the Western tradition, Socrates he didn't give lectures. He walked around the city and engaged people he encountered with questions. And he walked down to the port city of Piraeus and talked to people there and questioned yeah. them about the assumptions by which they lived. And he was an annoyance <laughs> in a lot of ways, but he engaged in a dialectic, in an argument. And there is something deeply democratic in this way of thinking about philosophy mm -hmm. and in this way of thinking about the common good. I think we shrink from invocations of the common good when we think of it being fixed by some authoritative definition once mm -hmm. and for all and imposed on people. We worry that it's at odds with liberty. but. A, a fuller, more adequate understanding of the common good, I think, is dialectical, interpretive, argumentative, contestable. And that's, I guess, just another way of saying that philosophy, understood in this way, is indispensable to democratic citizenship. Mm -hmm. It's indispensable to debates we need to have today about equality and inequality. Um, uh, and about our obligations to one another as citizens. And so what worries me about um, fixed scientific models of social and economic life is that they pretend to a neutrality that can't be achieved and that distracts us from the hard, difficult, sometimes contentious work of democratic argument and debate about the, the common good. And so my ambition is simply to recall philosophy to its um, place in the city, in the world in which we live, rather than to leave it residing abstract in the clouds mm -hmm. and beyond. 
and to recall us as democratic citizens to the philosophical part of our vocation, which is simply to equip ourselves, to reason together, to argue together, to question.